Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here. Today we're going to be taking a look at edutainment, which is the combination of education and entertainment. Here's a simple equation to help you understand the concept. You see, you take something educational and combine it with something entertaining, and yep, that's edutainment. The concept has been around for a very long time. It is difficult to know who really coined the term or used it first, as firsts are nearly impossible to deduce, and if I confirm anything, I know I'm just going to be met with, well, actually, Roses, you're wrong, because I know for a fact the term was first used by Edumactainment the Eighth in his book entitled How I Coined the Term Edutainment, and I'm just not about that scene. I can say that the portmanteau is said to have been used by Walt Disney, and the idea of children's education has been tied to him for a long time, especially when the True Life Adventure adventure series was developed. If you don't know what these are, they were documentaries meant to show the wonders of nature. You may recall White Wilderness, where the misconception of lemmings purposely throwing themselves off of cliffs originated. Lemmings are not known to commit mass suicide, so this footage was staged. Edutainment. As you may know, edutainment takes many forms. Children's shows like Bill Nye the Science Guy, Wishbone, and Schoolhouse Rock are good examples. It can also be in the form of music. I had many We Sing tapes and CDs with educational songs on them. But we're not going to talk about any of that. Today is dedicated to computer game edutainment from the 90s. Excellent. If you were not there, you cannot possibly understand the sheer amount of edutainment computer games that were released in the early to mid 90s. The industry was markedly smaller at that time and children's PC games were as popular as any other video game genre. Why play Doom when you could play Gizmos and Gadgets or Ally's Playhouse or Gus Goes to Cybertown? Wait, he wants to go where? Edutainment games didn't start in the 90s, of course. The Oregon Trail kind of kickstarted things a bit, and Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego is a beast of a franchise that is still going today. There have been edutainment games before the 90s, there have been edutainment games after the 90s, but I would say this is when edutainment was at its best, the golden years. I could discuss The Learning Company or Broderbund, but that's too predictable and popular, isn't it? I don't like talking about things people know about. I apparently like getting risky with my video hits by talking about forgotten shit that no one cares about. Will people watch this video? Who knows? That's my daily affirmation. I'm currently exploring better ones. I would like to talk about the rather fleeting EA Kids, a sub-label of Electronic Arts that released a handful of games between 1993 and 1995. The games had different developers and EA published them. Titles included Eagle Eye Mysteries, Eagle Eye Mysteries in London, Scooter's Magic Castle, Ping and Cookie's Cuckoo Zoo, wow, that title was a choice, and the Paintbox Pals games. Those included In Order, Peter Pan, Around the World in 80 Days, and The Jungle Book. They even had their own art center program where you could get your creativity on. Even though there is not a lot of information out there about this division, I think it's safe to speculate that EA created it to compete with other children's educational entertainment because it was such a lucrative business at the time. The learning company was already seeing massive success with their Super Solvers series. You may remember Treasure Mountain, where the goal is to capture innocent elves in a giant net as though they were butterflies. You also answer math and reading questions and throw money on the ground. Around the exact same time, Sierra also started their own line of educational games like EcoQuest and the Island of Dr. Brain. And of course, Broderbund had the Carmen Sandiego games and Mavis Beacon teaches typing. I always called her Mavis Bacon because bacon is just good. I like bacon. People were pretty excited by the line of games EA Kids had to offer, and they were covered in many PC gaming magazines. Before they were even released, the company got quite a glowing spread in computer gaming world, and they were also used in many educational guides for parents, teachers, and instructors. Though I have played the majority of these titles, I will not be discussing all of them. I'd like to focus on the ones I owned as a kid, the Paintbox Pals games and the Eagle Eye Mysteries games. Are all of these edutainment, and if so, how effective were they at educating? And why did does EA like to show characters in their underwear? Wow! All this and more! Right from the start, you can tell that EA knew what they were doing when it came to appealing to kids. The installation screen is presented as a movie theater, and while the game installs, a little popcorn machine pops up and fills to the top when the process is over. It's adorable. Once the games are installed, they can be chosen in the EA Kids Theater when you run them. I think this is very clever UI. The developers obviously wanted this to be an enjoyable experience from the moment you boot up these games. Let's begin with Peter Pan. This game came on a CD bundled with my Sound Blaster card back in 1993, and it also had the first Eagle Eye Mysteries game on it. I was very excited to play this game because prior to this, I hadn't had a game with full-blown voice acting. 
The three Paintbox Pals games were developed by Novatrade, who developed a number of children's PC games, and a lot of console games as well, such as Echo the Dolphin. Novatrade was everywhere, though. I bet if you look up a list of the games they developed, you'll recognize quite a number of them. The Paintbox Pals themselves are a set of four characters, all living and breathing art supplies. A spray can named Sally, a paintbrush named Jazz, an eraser named Winston, and a pencil named Nick. When Peter is in a sticky situation, some of them or all of them will turn toward the player and offer to do different things to help. For example... If he's chewing on that, he can't chew on me. And yes, the hourglass is sexy and has a perpetual headache. It follows the original story of Peter Pan quite loosely, but the characters are all familiar and... <laughs> Oh my god, what is that? Good gravy! Okay, well the close-ups of Peter are slightly terrifying, and on top of that, there's an overabundance of puns. Don't cut out. I'm counting on you. My dinner's arrived! Don't just sit there. Bear down and think. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scared. But I really enjoyed this game's premise, and I played it a lot when I was young. Out of the three games in this series, Peter Pan was the least educational to me. It simply tells a story. Though it does boast that it can help with reading comprehension and vocabulary. The story is as follows. Captain Hook has a treasure map, Peter steals it. Then Captain Hook and his pirate crew steal the map back along with the Lost Boys and Wendy. And you have to help Peter get them back. Maybe Winston the Eraser can help me. You finally flipped your wig, Hook! And dead. The amount of times you can erase someone's hair or clothing in all of these games is outright absurd. I know it's trying to be silly, but come on! Some of the solutions provided by the aid of the Paintbox Pals are really quite clever and fun. And others... Whoa! Oh my god, I nearly killed Winston. I'm a monster! Let's do it again. <laughs> I do think the devs could have made some better choices in regards to telling the Peter Pan story. The Native American stereotype is definitely still present, though I don't think anyone can quite beat Disney's animated version of Peter Pan in terms of most offensive and embarrassing. But it is there, just to a less egregious degree. Peter Pan is in worse trouble than he thinks. Oh boy. Even an article from 1994 criticized the use of the stereotype in a children's game. You probably don't want to put those kind of things in your educational game, just saying. Again, it's not the worst I've ever seen, the majority of the game is harmless. It has some pretty decent voice acting as well. Though I don't recall the character of Peter Pan being this clumsy and getting hurt this much. It does, however, have one of the happiest endings I've ever seen. Take these, Wendy. And if you ever get in trouble again, I'll be there. Just look over your shoulder, honey. Woo! The next game in the series is Around the World in 80 Days, based on the book by Jules Verne. I, Phineas Fogg, can go around the world in 80 days. Who does this? Who walks into a club and just announces this to anyone listening? Is this how competitions start? Okay, well, I just want to say that I can beat Dagger of Amon Ra in the amount of time that it will take me. Also, is it just me, or is this character's design directly inspired by this globe? The game makes an effort to incorporate more educational aspects. This time we see certain words highlighted, and when you click on them, you get a fun fact. The Louvre Museum! Let's go! Louvre. The Louvre, one of the world's great art museums, was originally a royal fortress and palace. It was built in the 12th century for King Philip II. Did you have fun listening to that fact? There's also a little emphasis on geography because <laughs> you're traveling. The fun facts are usually tied to which country you're in. I'd say this does make learning fun, though I feel like if you're going to choose a classic like Around the World in 80 Days, it might be wise to stay a little closer to the story. When I eventually read the book, I was very disappointed by the lack of a talking monkey travel partner. I figure if you're choosing iconic literature, you'd want to tell the story as accurately as possible and have that be a part of of the edutainment, at least that's just my humble opinion. On top of more content and longer gameplay, Around the World in 80 Days also hired professional voice actors, including Frank Welker, Jess Harnell, and Rob Paulson to bring these characters to life. I'm sending you to the Planet Mogul as our goodwill ambassador. 
The story is quite simple and only vaguely resembles the book, as I mentioned previously. You play Phineas Fogg, and you must beat your challenger, Hog's Breath, in a race around the world. Along the way, you get into some crazy hijinks and shenanigans! What's wrong with that emu? That is not an emu. Edutainment! Also, there's this. We'd like to rent a camel. One hump or two? Oh. That's not an answer to the question. Hey Phineas, do you like pizza? Oh. What about pineapple on pizza? Do you want pineapple on your pizza? Oh. Oh, okay. You will always win no matter what route you take, of course. And when you do, you will be crowned by the queen who has the most triangular breasts I've ever seen. Out of the three Paintbox Pals games, this one is probably my favorite, though it does also suffer from some short-sighted stereotypical characters. Some of it seems antiquated and silly, silly in the Swedish chef kind of way where it's too absurd to offend most people, but again, there are some subtle things. And some not as subtle things. The last game in the series is Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. This was definitely the most ambitious of the three. I didn't play this game as a kid, so I have very little connection to it, but playing it as an adult wasn't too bad. Everything has been ramped up. We now have words that light up as they are being read to the player, vocabulary words, and the ability to click on words after a definition is given. A. Man. Baby. Would. Be. A. Child. I gotta say, I'm kind of impressed by this game. This is going to sound ridiculous, but this was the one that was the most culturally sensitive and mature out of the Paintbox Pals trilogy, and this is the Jungle Book. This is the one you'd assume fucks it all up and comes across absurdly, but it was surprisingly well put together. It was almost a little too serious. It lacked the goofiness and the humor the other games had. I respect it though, because it closely followed the source material, and I'm always happy when children's content doesn't start to coddle the child. They can definitely handle a story like this. The game's pacing, however, was not the best. No, no, no. Like this, if you wish to catch your dinner. Is weird. It does have some goofy parts, but there are not enough to balance out the slogginess of the pacing. This is kind of what I wished Around the World in 80 Days was, accurately telling the story while educating and keeping things lighthearted and silly. If we could just squash those two games together, it would make the perfect edutainment game. I would say these games are pretty effective at teaching children reading, vocabulary, and some problem-solving skills. But the most important thing I've learned from this is that these sound effects are bonkers! Who was in charge of this? <laughs> now, EA Kids had software for all ages. Ping and Kuki's Cuckoo Zoo was for very young children, maybe preschool age. Scooter's Magic Castle and the Paintbox Pals were for ages 5 to 8. And then for slightly older kids, we had Eagle Eye Mysteries and Eagle Eye Mysteries in London. These are my all-time favorite kids' games. Also, the box clearly says 8 and up, so I can still play this game if I want to. There's no age limit on here. I'm young at heart. Don't you side-eye me, it's good to revisit young adult content sometimes. No age limit! So it's no mystery that I'm a fan of mystery. I've always loved the genre and have very warm and comforting memories of playing Clue with my family, or Clue on my computer, or reading murder mystery books that are also Clue. I guess you could say that I have a clue. I do genuinely enjoy a lot of mystery literature. Agatha Christie, for example, is a huge inspiration of mine. But I especially love murder mystery games because they lend themselves so well to the genre. They often have thrilling narratives and interesting, albeit hyperbolic characters, and intriguing settings like mansions. And more mansions. With the right gameplay mechanic, a mystery game can be sheer art. So I know what I'm about to say may sound a little nuts, but Eagle Eye Mysteries, they're not only the best in the EA Kids lineup, they're also some of the best mystery video games I've ever played. Okay, fine, maybe they're not the best, but they're up there in terms of mystery games that did the genre justice. 
These were developed by Stormfront Studios. They were best known for sports titles, but they also were responsible for developing Neverwinter Nights, an MMORPG that ran on AOL from 1991 to 1997. Now, the first Eagle Eye Mysteries game, not what I would call edutainment. It's one of the only boxes from EA Kids that does not say it's educational, and I'd agree. It does have a few facts here and there, but I would compare it most to a genuine mystery game, which is how it was advertised. Imagine Carmen Sandiego, but without the geography and educational tidbits. It takes place in the fictional town of Richview, where you can find Jake and Jennifer Eagle in their impossibly accessorized treehouse. They have a police radio and clearly an immodest attitude. Look at all of these awards just right there on display. Much like Murder, She Wrote's Cabin Cove being infested with murderers, Richview seems to be the victim of constant theft, betrayal, and misunderstandings? Seriously, sometimes the mystery is just, I made a mistake, my bad. You get many mysteries to choose from, each one lasting from about 10 to 20 minutes. The case is given to the player right away, and then you get hotspots you can travel to. Once you choose one, you rollerblade to the scene, and you can talk to suspects and collect clues that you punch into a customized PDA. Oh, children, please help me. Somebody took my precious ruby necklace. It was a gift to me from my father. We'll try, Mrs. Harper. Can you tell us what happened? After you're done talking to the suspects and finding evidence, you can go back into your PDA and choose relevant clues that support your conclusion, and the difficulty level does ramp up as you go. Eagle Eye Mysteries in London, which I think is the better of the two, keeps that same mechanic but changes the setting. You are now staying with Jake and Jennifer at their aunt and uncle's house located in London, and you get to travel all over the city and sometimes outside of it to solve cases. This is definitely an edutainment game with an emphasis on European history, and it's very effective. I replay this game sometimes and still find myself learning new things. And something cool about this one is that it has a story arc that goes until the final case. It's very detailed and sophisticated for a kid's game. What makes these games so much more enjoyable than other children's entertainment is the fact that they do a great job of keeping the mystery solvable while providing a challenge and having a diverse set of recurring characters and locations that make everything feel authentic. By the end, you do believe in the setting and have a sense of who the characters are. And this isn't to say that there isn't enough variety going on. There definitely is. But the redundancy of talking to these characters and seeing the settings change and animate as though people do live there makes everything seem believable. Well, as believable as two adolescent PIs who have a police radio in their luxury treehouse can be. It's definitely more convincing than the Olsen and Olsen Mystery Agency. Who makes the finest pizza? What's in your brother's dresser drawers? So what happened to EA Kids? These games got a lot of buzz and did fairly well, but despite that, no other games were made after 1995 under this label. Well, I'm not quite sure why things ended so abruptly, though it could be that in 1994, EA had another division creating children's games called Creative Wonders. They were mostly responsible for licensed titles. They did a lot of Sesame Street and Madeline games. I'm going to speculate that it was more lucrative to have just one division doing edutainment, so EA Kids was absorbed into Creative Wonders. And they had a pretty good run, though there wouldn't be any more Paintbox Pals or Eagle Eye Mysteries games. In 1998, Creative Wonders was bought by The Learning Company. Now, this is where it gets confusing. In 1995, SoftKey bought The Learning Company for over $600 million. If you're not aware, SoftKey was founded by Kevin O'Leary. Yes, the mean one on Shark Tank. SoftKey had acquired the most successful children's software companies in the mid-90s, including Creative Wonders, of course, Broderbund, and Mech. SoftKey changed their name to The Learning Company in 1996 after they acquired it, meaning Yes, this guy once owned Carmen Sandiego, The Oregon Trail, and Mist. In 1998, Mattel agreed to buy the learning company for a few billion dollars, which was a disaster. The moment it was purchased, it immediately started losing money. Here's a quote from an article written in September of 2000. The learning company lost nearly $300 million last year and is currently losing $1 million a day. And the May 1999 acquisition was even more disastrous than Quaker Oats's $1.7 billion purchase of Snapple, the soft drinks group, in 1994. Zounds! 
I feel like the cost of the company was just too high. Had Mattel not dumped billions of dollars on it, maybe they wouldn't have had to fire so many people. Maybe new games could have gone into production. 1998 was also the same year adventure games, quote, died. So it could have been that tech was just evolving, people's tastes were changing, and the lifespan of these kinds of games was simply ending. I do like where edutainment games have gone. They have moved to mobile with every app you could possibly think of, from counting games to reading games to games that teach you another language. In a lot of ways, things have improved and we have more resources for teaching children than ever. But I'm gonna be honest with you. To me, there is never going to be anything like the computer games I grew up on in the 90s. I really do feel like they were special. Eventually, in 2014, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt acquired the learning company brand, and they still own it presently. On their website, you can still view products for the Carmen San Diego and Oregon Trail brands, two games that have managed to stay relevant in pop culture. But there's really nothing left of EA Kids, Creative Wonders, and some of those beloved games from our past. EA Kids especially has been buried. I don't think it's probable that we'll see another Scooter's Magic Castle or Eagle Eye Mysteries, which is too bad because I was really hoping for Eagle Eye Mysteries in Chicago. Help Jake and Jennifer combat corrupt politicians and figure out the mystery of the Cook County soda tax while eating sausage and mushroom pizza. Cool. I think these games are worth remembering, and it's a shame they've been so forgotten because some of them have stood the test of time in terms of art style and animation. My number one recommendation does go to both Eagle Eye Mystery Games. They've aged well, they don't have questionable humor, and they remain enjoyable in adulthood. But I would love to see all of these games get released on GOG someday so you can all enjoy the absurdity of Winston being jammed into a crocodile's maw. Whoa! Thank you guys for joining me on this trip down memory lane. I truly hope it brought some really nice childhood memories back to the forefront of your mind. If you want to discuss your favorite or more forgotten edutainment games, feel free to do so in the comments. Hey everyone, thank you for watching this extremely long-winded video on EA Kids and Edutainment. If you'd like to follow me on social media, check out the description, and if you want to support the show or help me purchase the learning company so I can bring back Eagle Eye Mysteries, then consider contributing to my Patreon campaign. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next one.